Bibles, please, if you turn to God's Word, to the book of Matthew, chapter 6. And I'm going to share with you some thoughts along this line of seeking God first. How to seek God first. Little nine-year-old Joey was asked by his mother when he got home, said, what did you learn in Sunday school today? He said, oh, Mom, I heard about God sending Moses behind enemy lines on a rescue mission to set the people of Israel free out of Egypt. And he went on to say how that uh, uh, when he led them out, came, he came to the Red Sea, and so he got his engineers together, and they built a pontoon bridge. And they put it all the way across the Red Sea, and they, and they crossed over the sea. And then, and then Moses got on his walkie-talkie, and he, and he called headquarters. And he called in for an airstrike. They sent in bombers, and they, and they blew up the pontoon bridge. And, uh, you know, it's just an amazing thing, you know. And, and she said, is that what your teacher said? And he said, well, Mom... If I told you the story the way the teacher did, you'd never believe it. <laughs> sometimes when we're talking about God's ways, God's ways are sometimes miraculous and they're unbelievable. But you experience God's power. You experience God's love, His presence, His direction if we seek Him. And the Bible says in Matthew 6, 33, but seek ye, what's the word? First, the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Now, what in the world, what's he talking about? All these things. If you read the context, you'll find back in verse 24, he talks about finances. Verse 25, he talks about food. He talks about fashion. He talks about our physical condition. All these kinds of things that, that, that people worry about. And you'll either be a worrier or you'll be a worshiper. You cannot do both at the same time. You can't worry and worship God at the same time. Now, you might find yourself backslide after you worship, and you might find yourself worrying, but you've, you've plumb given up worshiping when you start worrying. And I want to call your attention to something that will be a help to us, I think, today. Today, we, we are talking about getting the, the gospel around the world. And the commission that Jesus Christ, before he left, that he gave to us, that we're going to be accountable to him. One day, we're going to stand before him. And we can say, we've done a lot of wonderful things, Lord. We've done some good things in our community, and we've done some good things for families. We've tried to be a bright, shining light in our area. And he says, well, what about Thailand? What about Greenland? What about Iraq? What about these people that I died on the cross for? Did you have even a burden for these folks? Were you even praying for these folks? Were you going? Were you sending people around the world? No church can do everything, but every church can do something. And no Christian can do everything, but every Christian can do something. And so it's the something that we're seeking God for today. We're asking Him to help us to seek Him first. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank You so much for the music that's been lifting up our hearts unto Thee. Praise unto You. And Lord, worship from our heart. Lord, we humble ourselves and ask You to calm our spirit. I ask you, Lord, that you would speak, that you would be the preacher. Lord, you taught this there in the Sermon on the Mount. People were sitting there listening, and you were trying to help them. And as you help, Lord, that allows us to glorify Almighty God. And as we do that, we get his blessing in return. So, Lord, I pray that you do that again today. Bless each and every one that came to your house. May they walk out the door sensing that they have been in your presence and that it has been good to be in the house of the Lord. Speak to hearts now. Save souls that are lost. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
if you're thinking about worrying, understand that, that worry actually causes problems. You know that. If someone uh, worries a lot, it can cause physical difficulties, ulcers, uh, all kinds of stress and all that kind of thing. God does not want that for us. Uh, the Bible says that the Gentiles worry over and over. You don't find the word worry in this passage. But you find Jesus saying, take no thought. Meaning, don't, don't ponder, don't meditate on things that you have no control over. He said, take no thought. Uh, who, who can just, by, by taking thought, can add an inch to their stature? I'm sure there are times that Brother, brother uh, Gage Gilbert, where are you? Where'd you go, brother? Right down here. I'm sure there are times that you would think, I, I kind of would love to play basketball. You know, but uh, God just didn't build you that way. You know, maybe, maybe a center because you're so fast and, and things like that. But, uh, uh, but as far as slam dunking, your legs have to be that, about that big around as, to slam dunk, I guess. God made us the way he wants us. And we can't change that. Why worry about that? Finances. You know, uh, it's, it's not something that, that we have to worry about. We have a heavenly father. W worry creates problems. Worry uh, indicates uh, the pagans. Worry confuses people. You know, if a Christian is worrying all the time, uh, you know, it, it, it makes us shake our head and wonder what's going on in their heart. You know, a, a, a worrier, don't you? A worrier is someone who makes a dark room brighter when they leave it. You know, everything's... everything's Negative and down and uh, uh, it's going to a beautiful day. Yeah, but I hear it's supposed to rain later. <laughs> Worry causes pain in God's heart. We see in, in verse number 30, uh, it says uh, there, it says, uh, O ye of little faith. When we worry instead of trust God, it brings pain to his heart. And so in, in, in this passage here, especially in, in verse 33, I'd like to share with you what it means to seek God and to seek God first. I encourage you to jot down these three little statements. The first one is, seek God on the first day of the week. Seek God on the first day of the week. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. First way we can do that is seek God on Sunday. Here you are. I'm preaching to the choir. You, you can check this off. I did that, Lord. I'm here. I'm here. Uh, some people are confused on this, and they, they, call, they call Sunday the Sabbath. No, the Sabbath is Saturday. Sabbath is Saturday. The Bible refers to Sunday as the first day of the week, refers to it as the Lord's Day. It's a time for us to gather uh, together and to, and to thank Him uh, for his, his grace in our life. Five thoughts about this. Upon the first day of the week, Jesus arose from the dead on the first day of the week, on Sunday. Jesus appeared to his disciples on the first day of the week, on Sunday. The anointing of the Holy Spirit descended at Pentecost on Sunday. Paul preached to the church on Sunday. Uh, church received offerings in the church uh, uh, on, on Sundays, 1 Corinthians 16, 2. I've got scriptures for all of these, and, uh, but, but I, I want to encourage you, as you think about even John on the Isle of Patmos, he was all alone. He was exiled there. They thought they, after they, according to church history, they tried to kill him, tried to martyr him. And they wanted him to have an agonizing death. They wanted to make an example of him. So according to church tradition, we don't have this in Scripture, uh, but, but they took him and put him in a boiling vat of oil, hoping that as he went down into that boiling vat of oil, that as he went down, he would scream and maybe curse God or whatever. They put him down in that boiling vat of oil, and it did not harm him, much like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that the fires did not harm them. We know that for a fact. And so the government decided that they, they thought, well, this is, yeah, this is really strange. Um, they thought, maybe we can't kill him. We're just going to exile him so he cannot have any contact with anyone else. When he got there to the Isle of Patmos, he was, according to uh, Revelation chapter 1, the Bible says in verse 10, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard the voice of God, heard the voice of the Lord. So I encourage you, please, make sure that you set aside the first day of the week and seek him on the first of your week. Today, 
Uh, oh, you know, what is today? Groundhog Day? I mean, seeking a fat vermin. I don't know if you saw that or not. I saw it holding up a, a fat a vermin, a, a, you know, the groundhog, and that he's the prognosticator, and, and somehow on this cloudy, snowy day that he did or did not see his shadow. And so we're going to... And there is a multitude of people out there in the snow and cold and bundled up. I mean, just an ocean of people out there to see that little critter. <laughs> They're seeking the wrong thing, folks. And then there's going to be a little pig skin this evening. Talk about a multitude. I don't know why they even go see that game with who's playing. But anyway, no, no harm, no foul. <laughs> but it's more of a tradition, you know, more of a, you know, that kind of thing. You know, sun, the, the weekend, Sunday is not weekend. Sunday is the first day of the week. And weekend is not for Michelob. Jesus Christ gave us everything. And so we meet together on Sunday to give to him our praise and our honor unto him. Second thought. After seeking God on the first day of the week, second thought is to seek God with the first dollar of our work. Seek God with the first dollar of our work. The Bible says... Proverbs 3, verse 9, Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. Let me explain it this way. Let's say that you had a very important and honorable guest that you were hosting at your house. And they sat down for dinner. At the end of dinner, you were serving dessert and you wanted to give a, a, a nice piece of cake that you had baked, ladies. And, and so you, you cut the cake and you... You cut it and, and, and you feed everybody in your family and, and the honorable, important guests that you invited. Oh, oops, we're all out of cake. And so you take his plate and you scrape off some crumbs off the cake tray and you bring him the, cr the crumbs. Now, th this is the way that a lot of us Christians treat God. Lord, now... You understand, I gotta, I, I, gotta, I gotta pay my taxes, and I gotta pay my insurance, and I, I gotta pay my gas bill, my electric, and, and I gotta pay my house payment, my car, and I gotta do this, and I gotta do that, and I've gotta do all this other thing. And, and, and Lord, I, you, know, you know my heart, I really wanna give to you. If I have anything left, Lord, I guarantee you, I'll give it to you. Oh, Lord, I'm sorry, I don't have anything left. You have to understand that car and that house. Everything that we hold in our hands, that's all going to burn up one day. You, you know that, right? It's all going to be gone. The only thing that you're going to have to show of your money is what you have invested in eternity and giving to the King of kings and Lord of lords. Now listen, please. I, I, I know that you think I've got a, a contradiction with going, I'm not a credible source because I'm the pastor of the church. But this is what I've believed and practiced and done long before ever God ever, ever called me into the ministry. Long before I ever got in, into the, the pastorate or, or anything, like, anything like that. I started tithing, started giving as a youngster. I, th I thank God that I saw it uh, exemplified in my parents. I'm so thankful that I heard it preached from the pulpit. I'm so thankful that, that I was able to learn some things uh, growing up in, in, in small ways, and then I just continued to trust God, and He can, to continued to show Himself faithful. You see, God can stretch nine-tenths of a dollar so much farther with Him as our partner than we can on our own, all ten-tenths. With God as your partner... There was a man that came to his, his pastor. He was very sincere. He was a very faithful man in the church. Loved the Lord. And in his own way, he was, he was a faithful giver. And um, uh, he said that at least. And he came to the pastor one day uh, during the week. And he, he, said, he said, Preacher, I, I really wish you'd pray with me about something. I, I really want to please the Lord. He said, I, I got a really great promotion at work. And my pay is almost 
going to double. I mean, and, and the preacher was saying, wow, well, praise God, that's great, congratulations. He said, yeah, 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 but, but there's a problem. You see, I've been, I've been a tither, you know, for years. I've tithed, you know, uh, uh, right on the front end of what I've received, and, and, I've, and God is blessed, and, and this is another blessing that he's showing himself faithful, and there, there could have been anybody else got this. I know this is the hand of God and, and blessing me for my faithfulness. But he said, my old flesh is looking at what my tithe would be, and it's just so much more money. And I'm just afraid I'm not going to be able to do that. I want you to pray with me that I, you know, I don't know what to do. He said, well, let's do, let's pray about that. So they knelt down there at the front of the church and the pastor put his arm around him and said, now, dear Lord, I thank you for this faithful man and he loves you and he served you and, and he, he's, he's given to your work and, and all this. And, and, and he truly has a sincere heart. And, and Lord, this, this great opportunity, this raise and promotion, and he's afraid that he's not going to be able to uh, to continue tithing, he said, Lord, would you just go ahead and, and take the promotion away so that way he can continue obeying you? <laughs> no, preacher, no, preacher. Hey, 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 no, it's okay. I can do it. I can do it. I can do it. <laughs> Our old nature, we all have that. We all have that. And, and, um, uh, let me give you three reasons to tithe. The lowest re reason to tithe, to give 10%, to give that first 10% to the Lord, the lowest reason is that if you tithe, you'll prosper. That's the lowest reason. But my friend, God's promised. He said, thy presses uh, shall break forth in new wine, that their barns be filled with plenty. Given it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down and shaken together, and running over shall men give into your bosom. As we, as we faithfully give to the Lord that, that first 10%, um, the lowest reason is that you'll prosper. A higher reason is that there's a need for a lost world to hear the gospel. There's a need for a lost world to hear the gospel, both at home and abroad. But the highest reason for you to tithe is to honor and glorify Almighty God. To reach in your purse, ladies, and pull out that offering. To reach in your wallet, gentlemen, and pull out that offering and put it in the offering plate. And you say before God, Lord, I love you. Thank you for your provision. Lord, thank you for the privilege of giving back to you. You are not. Please do not give to Volusia County Baptist Church. Please give to God through Volusia County Baptist Church. Give to God. Honor Him. For those who would say, uh, preacher, this thing of seeking first, uh, seeking God with the first dollar of our work, uh, seek ye first the kingdom of God, um, that's Old Testament law. And we don't have to do that. Well, there's a lot of truth to that. There is. But if you study the Old Testament law, you'll find out that it wasn't 10% that was, the, was what God was uh, having Israel do. It was much, much, much more. You don't want Old Testament law. And if you look there in Genesis chapter 14 and verse 20, you'll find that Abraham, whenever he uh, went to rescue Lot, you remember the, the, the king of Sodom and Gomorrah and all them, they were... They were um, uh, just run over by these other kings. And, and, and they took Lot and his family hostage. And, and Abraham, he armed his servants, trained servants. They went after him. And you talk about going behind enemy lines. They fought those kings and they rescued Lot. And they took back and, and, and all the spoil and all that kind of thing. The Bible says in, in Genesis 14, verse 20, that Abraham gave tithes to the priest of God named Melchizedek. My friend, that predates the law. That's before law. Truly, New Testament giving, I believe New Testament giving... Uh, Jesus did not, Jesus, I say again, did not uh, take tithing out. He said, this you, you should do and more. In New Testament, we're giving called grace giving. We're saying, Lord, this is 10%, this is yours now. The 90%, what do you want me to do with it? 
You're in charge. Holy Spirit, you lead me and guide me. You see, in the Old Testament, they didn't have the Holy Spirit indwelling believers. Holy Spirit rested upon believers. Holy Spirit not in, did not indwell believers. That's why Barnabas, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to leave this here in just a second, but that, that's why Barnabas, whenever a need was presented, he went and sold property, and he brought the whole amount and said, Here, apostles, you all divide up the need. Seek God the first day of the week. Seek God the first dollar of our work. And last, seek God in the first decision of our walk. Seek God in the first decision of our walk. Our devotion needs to be to Jesus Christ. The very first thought in our mind as, as we get the bed off our back, the very first decision, the very first, first thought that should be is, Lord, thank you for another day. Thank you for strength. Thank you for health. Um, Tito and Yvonne. I uh, saw them right back here. They had a tragedy in their family in, in uh, Puerto Rico, and, and uh, they went over to Puerto Rico, and, and, and that, that earthquake just happened over there. Listen, folks, there are tragedies and things happening everywhere we turn. Buses running into embankments, um, uh, fuel trucks exploding on the interstate on I-85, Cancer diagnosis, all kinds of tragedies happening. And if, and if you don't have uh, that kind of upheaval and hurricane in your family, husbands and wives splitting and, and problems going on and all that kind of stuff, if you don't have that, you thank God for His provision, His protection, and His power. And every step of the direction of your life, the first thing you should do, the first thing we should do is to consult with God and say, Lord, what do you want? What do you want about my job? What do you want about my family? Young people, you better be praying for that boyfriend or that girlfriend. You say, I don't have one. Will you pray for the right one? Pray about where to go to college. Don't follow the money. Follow the Holy Spirit. God will provide. He knows what's in store for you the rest of your life. Seek God in the first decision of our walk. Ephesus was a great church. It really was. It had so much going on. But in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 4, God spoke to the church at Ephesus. And He said, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, that ye have left your first love. Our first love. Oh, I've heard a lot of preachers try to nail that down to certain things, you know, first love. According to the Word of God, our first love is to love Almighty God. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength. If you've ever been in love with Jesus Christ more than you are today, then my friend, you're backslidden. The first decision of our walk. We kind of think of God sometimes as a spare tire. God wants to be the steering wheel, folks. He wants to be the one directing our lives. Not when everything else uh, fails and, and not when everything else doesn't, doesn't pan out and all that kind of thing. Oh, well, maybe I should pray. <laughs> That's not seeking God first. Now, we don't seek God so that He can give us success. We don't seek God so that He can give us prosperity. We don't seek God so that we can have a, a, an easy life. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things should be added unto you. Job said this. He said, though He slay me, yet will I trust Him. God, if you're good to me, I'll be good to you. I'll give, I'll sing your praises, I'll pray, I'll read the Bible, but, but you let some, some things happen in my life I don't understand, I don't want. Some things you should have stopped. Guess what? You and I are going to have words. We serve an omnipotent God. Let me, let me give you just a, a, three things that will help with this 
first decision of our walk. Focus on God's praise. You praise Him. You praise Him on credit. If, if, the, if the storm clouds of life are gathering, you praise Him on credit because He's the same God in the sunshine as He is in the dark clouds. He loves you just the same. Psalm 109 verse 30 says, I will greatly praise the Lord with my mouth. Yea, I will praise Him among the multitude. Focus on God's praise. Secondly, remember God's promises. His promises have not changed. Titus 1, 2, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. God cannot lie. He said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. He said that right before he went up to heaven. And the person of Jesus Christ indwelt those believers in the, in, uh, in, in the presence of the Holy Spirit of God. You've got God within you, and He will never leave you. We are sealed unto the day of redemption. Amen. God's promises. Remember His promises. Remind yourself of His promises. Focus on His praise. And last, trust in God's purpose. Romans eight twenty eight is still in the book. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Sometimes our purposes are not equal to His purpose. His purpose is best. His purpose is right. Young lady, eight years of age, her name was Fanny Crosby. You might know her because she wrote a lot of, a lot of wonderful songs. At eight years of age, her parents, because of her sickness thought that they would uh, treat her in a certain way, and a doctor uh, guided them to treat her in a certain way, burned her eyes, and she was blinded at the age of eight. She didn't let that stop her. She knew Jesus Christ as her personal Savior. She wrote these words. She said, Oh, what a happy soul I am, although I cannot see. I am resolved that in this world contented I will be. How many blessings I enjoy that other people don't. To weep and sigh because I'm blind, I cannot and I won't. She's the one who wrote, Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. The blessed assurance that she has. And by the way, she sees Jesus face to face. She's healed. Our adversities, our problems, the things that, we, that happen in each and every one of our lives. Storms will come to every life in here. There's not a person in... You know, we look around, we say, well, they're smiling, they're laughing, they, they seem fine. They didn't have their good foot cut off like Sharon Crawford did. She only had one good leg left. And two weeks ago, they, had, they took off the other, a lot of the other foot. Guess what? I've still got ten toes and ten fingers. Guess what? I can hear. And we've got folks right over here that, that can't hear, that depend on sign language interpreting. You look around, you're going to find people that are suffering. If, if you think your, your case is really bad, come with me sometime to the hospital and let's visit some people. It'll encourage your heart as you look at God's blessing upon your life. Seek God and seek Him first. Then all these things shall be added unto you. Heavenly Father.